Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today I'd like to talk about seed plants. If you recall previously we had divided the plant kingdom into two broad categories. Plants that produce seeds and plants that did not produce seeds. Among the seedless plants we had divided them further into non-vascular plants and vascular plants. The non-vascular plants included the mosses, the hornworts, and the liverworts, and the seedless vascular plants included the ferns, the club mosses, the horsetails, and of course the risk fern. Today inshallah we shall talk about the other major category of plants, the seed plants. Among these we shall talk about five important categories of plants or phylums. These include the cycads or the cycadophyta, the genophytes, the ginkophyta, and the coniferophyta or the conifers, and the anthophytas, the flowering plants. The seed plants themselves, however, can be divided into two broad categories, depending on what type of seeds they produce. The first category are the gymnosperms. They produce naked seeds, or seeds that don't have a fruit around them, so to speak. The second category are the angiosperms. These are flowering or fruit producing plants. Seeds that have fruit around them. These are flowering plants because fruits are the end result of a flower. So seed plants can be divided into two major categories, the gymnosperms, those that produce naked seeds, and the angiosperms are the flowering of fruit-bearing plants. The first four categories of plants here are the gymnosperms, and they will have simple type of seeds. And the fifth category, the flowering plants, the anthophytes, are the angiosperms. So what you see before you now is the broad outline of the plant kingdom. Before we begin, we shall talk about the seed itself. So what's so big deal about the seed, you say? Well, seed is the plant embryo, really. It results from the fusion of the male and female gametes, the sperm and eggs, so to speak, which come from the male and female gametophytes. In seed plants, the male gametophyte, the male spore, is called the pollen, and the female gametophyte, the female spore, is called the ovule. The pollen grain includes the sperm, the food that it needs for its journey, and a protective coating. So the male gametophyte in seed plants is called the pollen grain and the female gametophyte in seed plants is called the ovule. Seed has many functions but its primary function is to protect the embryo. It also contains the food supply for the young plant until it's able to do photosynthesis and is able to sustain itself. Seed also aids in dispersal of the plant. The farther away the seed lands from the parent plant, the less the competition between the parent plant and the young plant. The seed diagram before you shows the embryo and also the cotyledons in the seed. This is the stored food for the embryo. Seeds can be basically divided into those that have one cotyledon or two. For me the analogy is like if they have one lunchbox or two lunchbox. Those that have one lunchbox are called one cotyledon seeds and those that have two lunchboxes are called two cotyledon seeds. Seeds of course have a protective coat. As you can see here, as a seed grows, before it's able to do photosynthesis, it needs the nutrient supply to grow. That's provided by the stored food. Once the young plant is able to do photosynthesis, then it can go unencumbered, producing its own food. In seed plants, fertilization does not require continuous film of water, as is the case in more primitive plants. And again, seeds can be divided into two categories, the ones that have one or two cotyledons. This diagram shows two cotyledons, and the corn seed has one big cotyledon over here as you can see. Now let's talk about these plants one at a time starting with the cycads. The cycads or cycadophyta, there are apparently some hundred species of these left. In these plants, the male and female cones, which can be up to one meter long, are in separate trees. So there's a tree with the male cone and there's a tree with the female cone. Although they resemble palm trees, they're not palm trees. Palm trees, in fact, are flowering plants, the last category of plants that we shall study. They're quite beautiful and apparently exclusive in the tropics and subtropic areas. The second category of plants are the genophytes. Among the genophytes, there are the generum nodum, apparently some 30 species of tropical trees in the climbing lines. They look quite beautiful, although I'm not sure if I could recognize one if I saw one. Nevertheless, the second category is the genera ephedra, some 35 species of shrubbery plants in desert and arid regions. And the third category, which I hope I get a chance to see someday, is the Welwitchia. Apparently there's only one species of this plant left. It's a bizarre looking plant found only in South Africa. It has large tuberous roots 
and apparently may live up to a thousand years. So, so far we have talked about the Psycast, the Genophytus, and now we shall talk about my favorite plants, the Ginkgo Phyta or the Ginkgo Biloba. The Ginkgo Phyta or the Ginkgo Biloba plant, there's only one living species of these. It has very beautiful fan-shaped leaves, and in these plants also, the male and the female reproductive structures are on separate trees. All of these plants now are cultivated, that is, none of them are living in the wild. They're frequently used as decorational plants because they're hardy and they tolerate smog and city pollution. Quite beautiful, I think. Among the gymnosperms are naked seed producing plants. The fourth category, a very, very important category, are the conifers or the coniferophytes. The conifers, of course, have cones. These include the pine tree, the fir tree, the cypress, the redwoods, and in these plants, the male and female cones are on the same tree. In other words, you'll see a conifer, and then you'll see two types of cones. One of these will be a male cone, and the other one will be a female cone. The conifers can be distinguished among themselves by the type of leaves they have. The two main categories of leaves are needle-like leaves and the scale-type leaves, as you see before you here. Most conifers are evergreens with a heavy cutin coating to protect themselves from losing water. Now, I used to think that evergreens never lose any leaves. In fact, they lose individual leaves because they get old, etc. But they don't lose all the leaves at one time, and hence they appear evergreen. There are some conifers, however, that are deciduous, that is, they lose their leaves. Examples include the larches and the bald cypress trees. Shedding leaves is an adaptation as plants lose most of their water through leaves. Now you might not think much of these evergreen leaves because they're so skinny and unassuming, but they're actually quite complex in this structure. This is a scanning electron micrograph of a pine needle. And these trees can go very, very big and are an important source of lumber for various different uses. This is the giant redwood. Now that concludes our brief survey of the gymnosperms, including the cycads, the genophytes, the ginkgo biloba, the conifers, the coniferophytes. Now we shall talk about the angiosperms, the flowering plants, or the antophytes. The antophyte or the flowering plants, they make flowers and form seeds that are enclosed in fruit, like you see before you. This is the largest phylum, the largest group of plants. Apparently there are some 250,000 species of flowering plants. They can be broadly divided into monocotyledons and dicotyledons, that is plants that produce seeds with one cotyledon and plants that produce seeds with two cotyledons. You can frequently recognize if a plant is a monocot, that it has one cotyledon in a seed, or a dicot, that it has two cotyledons in a seed. Two cotyledons typically results in plants that kind of look like these, whereas one cotyledon, like a corn plant, not like this. There are many distinctive features of two cotyledons or dicots or one cotyledon or monocot plants. We shall talk about these features briefly, but let's give us some examples of these plants. Among the monocots, apparently there are some 65,000 species. These include the grasses, the orchids, the lilies, and the palms. Among the dicots, the shrubs, the trees, except for the conifers, of course, the cacti, the wildflowers, the garden flowers, vegetables, and herbs. Let's talk about the differences between a monocot and a dicot. From a seed point of view, of course, a monocot has one cotyledon, and a dicot has two cotyledons. But there are other distinctive features in their leaves, their stems, in their flowers, and their roots. Monocot leaves usually have veins that are parallel, kind of like this. Whereas dicot leaves are veins that are branched, like this. In regards to stem, Monocot stems, the vascular bundles are in a complex arrangement like this, whereas in dicots, the vascular bundles are arranged in a ring form. In regards to the flowers, the monocots, the floral pattern is usually in multiples of three, where in dicot plants, the floral pattern is usually in multiples of four or five. And finally, in regards to roots, monocots typically have fibrous roots, whereas in dicot, tap roots are usually present. So these are some important distinctive features of monocots and dicots. They're different in their seeds, they are different in the way the veins travel in leaves, they're different in how the vascular bundles are arranged in stems, they're different in their floral patterns and in their roots. Here, for example, you can recognize this plant as a monocot because the veins in these leaves are parallel. 
and this is a dicot plant. Here's some distinctive features of a monocot on the left and a dicot plant on the right, multiples of three and multiples of five flow pattern. Now, in regards to the flowering plants that produce flowers, the end result of a flower, as I stated, is the fruit. A fruit develops from the flower's female reproductive structure. If you look at the flower structure over here, the male reproductive parts are the stamens, which includes the anther and the filament, as we have talked about before, and the female reproductive structure is the carpal, the stigma, style, and the ovary. In the ovary is the ovule, that's where the egg is. The pollen, of course, is produced in the anther, and it floats over there and lands here in the stigma, and then the sperm travels down over here, and fertilization occurs in the ovule. The fruit develops from this structure over here, and after a while, of course, the petals are lost, and what we see in the end is the fruit body. The fruit has many functions. One is that it helps in dispersal of the plant. Animals, for example, can eat the fruit and carry the seeds with them in their intestines until they poop them out somewhere far from the original plant. Some fruits with adaptations helping seed dispersal by wind and water, like you see before you over here. Coconut seed, for example, is buoyant and can float in water and go far away from the parent plant. I'd like to finish today by talking about the lifespan of anthophytes, the flowering plants. The lifespan of flowering plants can be between weeks to years. Simply speaking, they can be divided into three categories. Annual plants, those that live less than a year. Biannual plants, these are plants whose lifespan lasts two years. Examples of these include carrots, beets, and turnips. And then there are perennials. These plants live for several years, growing flowers and seeds periodically, usually once a year. So annual plants live less than a year. Biannual plants, their life cycle lasts two years. And then the perennial plants, perennials live for several years, growing flowers and seeds periodically, typically once a year. The annual plants, those that live for less than a year, many of these are herbaceous, meaning that they have green stems without woody tissue. And that makes sense because they didn't have time to grow a tough woody tissue. Now they form seed that survive the winter, and those seeds grow in the following year. Biannual plants, their lifespan lasts two years. Many develop storage roots like carrots, beets, and turnips. Now these plants, in the first year they grow, and then they're dormant. In the second year they grow, and then they produce flower, and then they die. So this is their life cycle, which lasts two years. That concludes our brief survey of seed plants. Until next time, as-salatu wa-salamu alaykum.